next speaker needs no introduction. I love her. Dr. Anna Kobeka. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it is great to be here with all of you. I see many friendly faces, some I recognize, and I am thrilled to be here with you. I'm here all weekend. I really want to thank Brian and Robin for bringing me here and bringing me back last year, from, again, from last year, and all the work that goes into it. To see the size of this community triple in just a year is profound. So like we have hit a pulse, a nerve that is working, that something is working, right? Keto is working. And I wanna talk a little bit more today about how we really optimize keto for women and for hormonal balance. Because that is key, right? Hormonal balance is key. It's nice to be thin, feel thin, and look healthy, but feeling healthy, living healthy, having joy in our lives, laughter, quality relationships, and a good memory of what we're doing too. That's not a bad thing to have either, right? And not to mention, you know, again, healthy sex drive, intimacy, connections, and, and living our purposes, living our purposes. So... A little bit about me, I'm Emory University trained. I trained as a gynecologist and obstetrician. So I'll talk about why it's so important. Like what is a gynecologist doing up here talking about keto, right? Not very many of us, but it's so important and we are really changing the way we balance hormones from a gynecologic perspective. And that's really critical because what we've been doing hasn't been working. Can you agree with that? Like our standard way of balancing hormones, maybe not working quite as well as we'd like it to. So we have to do that. I'm also board certified in anti-aging and integrative medicine expert in functional medicine, and I'm the author of the best-selling book called The Hormone Fix, which I'm super thrilled to say is a national bestseller. So that's been a blessing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So here's what we're going to talk about today, and what I want you to remember is, number one, it takes more than hormones to fix our hormones, right? Because if it wasn't the case, then everyone on thyroid hormone would be thin, Right? So it takes more than hormones to fix our hormones. And maybe we've been looking at hormones all wrong all this time. So first thing, I want you to start thinking about you know, what we need to do to take care of ourselves as an individual and balance our hormones. And I want you to understand the keto green concept and how that really can work to optimize your health and longevity and you know, qu certainly the quality of your days in life and to incorporate this into your lifestyle to give you more energy, the balanced hormones we all desire, and real fun, experience real fun. So, I don't think I have to tell everyone that men and women are different, right? We do things a little differently. We experience things a little differently. We even feel things a little differently. Well, I'm here to tell you that we even need to do keto a little differently. Men, 10 times more testosterone than women. And a very little known fact is that men actually produce six times more estrogen in the brain than women. Go figure, right? We're relying on our ovarian production. But how cool is that? And I'll come to teach you why that's so critically important in this concept and why the keto green concept really helps us with these differences. So yeah, men and women are different. Now, keto is everywhere, right? And then you may have heard some controversy. Is keto good for the thyroid, bad for the thyroid? Good for the thyroid, bad for the thyroid? And so I certainly dug into this research and looked at the tens of thousands of women that have been doing my online programs and those that I have results for in looking at their thyroids and seeing how that is. So on First for Magazine, this is my youngest fan, my goddaughter, Isabella. And um, pulling off, just hot off the presses right now on, press, on newsstands, First for Women, keto thyroid cure, right? Like, so talking about ketones for women. And at age 53, I finally get to be a two-page spread in a magazine, right? <laughs> Not quite the centerfold, but, you know, close enough for me. All right. So excited to talk about these differences and these changes and the significance that hormones have on our body. And hormones play havoc on our body. And I tell this story, you know, when I first started hearing about the keto thyroid controversy, I looked at the research. Where was it really saying about keto being bad for the thyroid? Has anyone heard that? 
Well, I think it's really important to dispel that myth and to look where that, those statements came from. So much of that research, actually two articles that I found to be able to review, looked at um, uh, children with obesity and seizure disorder on seizure medications and looking at that connection. So I think the, you know, the obesity issue, the this anti-seizure medications, may be a little bit confounding in our um, declaration of thyroid disease. So I looked at my patient population. I looked at free T4, free T3, reverse T3, and TSH, as well as thyroid antibodies. I saw improvements across the board, across the board, and as well with myself. So now this is, I'm going to share with you my story. I feel like we have an intimate group here, right? Uh, we are here for a reason. We're here to improve each other's lives, and we're building together a community, a community that is loud and proud and bold and brave. And so with that, I share these pictures that I am not brave enough to share <laughs> on a dating profile for sure, right? These would not show up there. But I want to share with you my um, pictures. I was over 240 pounds in this picture in my red sweater. And I was struggling. I was hurting. I was running a medical practice and a medical spa and a family. And I was a wife and a scientist and a boss and had so many hats, right? One head, so many hats, like many of you. I was, I was struggling. I also had significant hair loss. I mean, you can see on that image, you know, way back to the crown, hair loss, huge hair loss. And that's a real, that was a stress-related hair loss, not thyroid-related hair loss. So to share with you a little bit about my story and my background, you know, I've, I've been in medicine since, you know, really the, as, as far back as I can remember, I've wanted to be a physician, a healer, someone that helps people. And um, working in, in just my life, you know, working with so many women and helping them through their stories and their journeys. And I know each of you have your own story. So my story in 2006, we lost our son in a tragic accident. He was only 18 months old. I was breastfeeding him that day. And I share with you that from that moment on, I never had another drop of breast milk. And moms that have breastfed, you know that if you miss a feeding by 15 minutes, you are engorged. Stress puts your body into, really, into some kind of hell. Stress puts your body into the pits. And from that point, as much as I knew as a trained gynecologist and obstetrician, as much as I knew as a hormone specialist, I was out of my league. I knew nothing. I didn't know how to handle this new reality that I didn't want to handle at all. I didn't want to deal with another day. I didn't want to wake up and face another day. And I was struggling. And I, not only that, I was told I would never have another child. I would never be able to have another baby. I was irreversibly infertile at age 38 with premature early menopause and um, devastation upon devastation in our family. And this literally took me on a journey around the world, around the world looking for answers. And, and, and I found some. I certainly did. I did find some answers. You know, um, Aristotle said the soul suffers when the body is diseased or, diseased or traumatized, while the body suffers when the soul is ailing. My soul was ailing. How many of you can relate to this statement? You know what heartache feels like. You have felt heartache in your life. And literally, our heart physically hurts. There are oxytocin receptors in our heart, the hormone of love, connection, and bonding. And heartache is a real physical phenomenon. Beyond that, our physiology drives our behavior. So I was depressed and I was stressed, and I was hurting, and I was suffering in so many ways. But through this journey, I found answers. First of all, we're not alone. We're never alone. And Mother Nature always wins. When we go back to Mother Nature, right, when we seek our root foundationally, improve our health, improve it one step at a time, not just with the nutrition we're seeking, but with the thoughts that we're thinking. And that's key. And so from there, I was able to lose those 80 pounds and keep them off for a decade and conceive a healthy baby at age 41. And thank you. Thank you. She's right here, actually. Stand up with my other three daughters. I have four daughters, and they're here with me. And I will share with you this miracle child. <laughs> And so, I mean, that's key, but let me tell you, PTSD doesn't stop there. The 
Post-traumatic stress disorder is an underlying physiology that continues to wreak havoc. And this is something I learned as I hit age 48. So that was at 38 to age 48. And then I hit this metabolic stall that many of you may have experienced. The weight that comes on despite not doing anything different. Did anyone, has anyone experienced that? Oh yeah, right? Like no matter what I'm doing, all of a sudden, 5, 10, 20 pounds, right? As a cocky gynecologist, when my patients would come and tell me that, oh, I'm, I'm gaining weight and I'm not doing anything different. Like I'm in my 30s, I'm like, Sure, you're not, right? Really? Surely you're eating like a Snickers bar in between lunch and dinner. You know, what's going on? No, seriously, it's a metabolic stall. We go in through this metabolic deficit, essentially, this mitochondrial senescence, this siesta of our, of our cells, and we need to heal that. And also what happens, and this took me at age 48, the hormones were just troublesome. I had to figure out, okay, I've been over 240 pounds. I didn't want to get there again. So what did I need to do? So I'm like, okay, ketogenic diet. This is 2014, 2013, 2014. I'm like, I know that whenever I put a patient on a ketogenic diet in the perimenopause, they would complain of irritability and, um, and feel like they're hitting a wall. And so I'm like, well, let me, I don't want this weight to go on. I'm going to do everything I can. So I started doing that. And I found what was happening to me is I was going keto crazy. Keto crazy. I like to use that term because that definitely was my experience. And irritable, kind of like frenetic a little bit. And that's not a place to want to be at the time. I had one in elementary school, one in middle school and one in high school. Yes, you cannot be off when you've got teenagers in the house, right? They will manipulate you. <laughs> so I had to figure this out really quickly, and that's when I really went to the research. And I love when Ken was putting up historical research. Well, in 1924, there was a, um, a paper uh, presented from Cambridge by Dr. Wigglesworth that looked at combining alkalinity with ketosis. As a functional medicine doctor, I had clients check urine pH to guide them on their diets and their programs. So I started looking at this. Urine pH was acidic, 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 acidic. And so I started incorporating more alkaline, low-carb vegetables, got into the before supporting detoxification. When we're removing fat, we're removing toxins. And for hormonal balance, that is key. We need to be really, really balanced in this and not create any more inflammatory or intracellular mayhem than may already be occurring. So creating this low carbohydrate, greens, incorporating the fiber, the alkalinizers, the micronutrients and macronutrients that come with that, monitoring urinary pH to to monitor myself, I also discovered some other things. That when I would walk on the beach in the morning, if I didn't do anything different, I would be more, I'd have a more alkaline urine pH for the day. So in my program, I call it the Keto Green Way, and I talk about this in my book, that it takes more than, right? It's more than food. It's more than what we eat. There's a lifestyle. There's a keto green lifestyle. There's a ketogenic lifestyle that has to be incorporated because it's not just food alone, and it is individual. You and I will have two different ways to fine-tune our program, but we don't know if we're not testing. And I'll talk about that too. Now, most of us don't know what's going on, and over half of us, if not 47 to, to the majority of us, experience a hormonal imbalance. This study looked at 2,000 women aged 40 to 60 and found that over 47% experienced a hormonal imbalance. And of that, 72% didn't realize it was hormones till much, much later. And of those symptoms, we ex experienced these mood swings, weight gains, sleep disturbances, anxiety, and hot flashes. But what we attribute to hormonal imbalance is irregular cycle, PMS, you know, breakthrough bleeding. Um, those are commonly the symptoms that bring you to my office as a gynecologist. So another thing is that most, so a good portion of women don't realize that memory loss or brain fog ca is a function of hormonal imbalance as well as urinary incontinence. What was key of the 72% of women that the majority said their parent, their symptoms began at age 36. And I believe that. We talk about menopause, perimenopause, and say that, well, it's age 52, right? But it's not. There's this whole window of neurologic vulnerability that I want to say is age 35 to 55. 
35 to 55 at least, and this is kind of what's happening with our hormones. This isn't exactly to scale or based on serum concentration. This is a diagram based on the importance of these hormones. I want to share with you, like, so the top line, the red line is progesterone. Note the steep decline of progesterone in our mid-30s to mid-40s, right? We get a steep decline of progesterone. Progesterone is a neuroprotective hormone. It's also the hormone produced, you know, predominantly post-ovulation. It's produced and has functions, receptors all over our body, in our brain, in our bones, certainly for vaginal health, and in our fascia. When we're getting older and it hurts to walk, our joints are stiff, we're having incontinence issues, prolapse issues, progesterone's a big part of that. So we know good research on that, and we know there's good research on progesterone in the brain. But somehow, we forget about that in the, medical, in the medical science. But progesterone decreases 75% from age 35 to 55, and estrogen decreases 35% from ages 35 to 50. And these are the typical symptoms, right? We know about these symptoms. PMS, hot flashes, night sweats, right? I mean, these symptoms, mood swings, weight gain, sleep disturbances, anxiety, and hot flashes, those are key symptoms that affect the quality of life. And what happens? We often, 35 to 45, we're being put on birth control pills. We're given Prozac, anti-anxiety medication. You know, we're getting sleep medications, such as benzos. Well, you know, we know that those medications in and of themselves can increase our neurologic deficiencies as we grow older. Women have 2.4 times as much Alzheimer's as men. And I think this is, this is a key problem. This period of time, which I call neurologic vulnerability, is, um, let me show you that again. Oop, there we go. This period of time under this window, of that's a period of neurologic vulnerability. It's not just, you know, perimenopause. I mean, this perimenopause is symptomatic of neurologic vulnerability. So we have to look deeper and say, well, what else is going on here, right? So I'm going to give you um, this. You guys can download this text, what's happening to my hormones, for a good description and to get that graph. Um, so you just text hormones to 912-330-6353, and you'll be able to get that graph. And I'll give this to you again at the end. But we want to see what's happening. Now, this blew my mind. This research was presented in 2015. And I've been watching a lot of the brain science research for quite a long while now. So here, I want you guys to look at this. This is impressive. Well, look in the, the blue line are symptoms. Endocrine and neurologic symptoms, those hot flashes, that insomnia, the memory loss, those mood swings, neurologic and endocrinologic symptoms, that blue line in the perimenopause. What's happening to our brain? The red line is our brain's ability to use glucose for fuel. Our brain's ability to use glucose for fuel. There's a steep decline here. You see that how the red line dips at the beginning of perimenopause, that 35 to 40, 45 age range when we're experiencing PMS, mood swings, insomnia, hot flashes, irritability, hating our husband two weeks out of the month, you know, things like that. So what's going on here? If, as the ability for our brain to utilize glu glucose for fuel is an estrogen-dependent and probably progesterone-dependent phenomena. So what does that mean? So when our, where, when our hormones are declining, there is less of our reproductive hormones to help this glucose utilization of fuel for the brain. So we're getting these symptoms of irritability. We're getting these symptoms of burnout. We're getting these symptoms, uh, you know, unable to sleep. So then we can't have our body restore itself. Well, why is this so different in women than men? Well, I mentioned earlier, men, in men's brain, they produce six times as much estrogen as women. They don't get this steep decline. Now, they get it. Andropause comes. You guys are not off the hook, right? As, you know, andropause comes. Testosterone declines, and testosterone leads to declining estrogen production. So we really have to keep our body as healthy as possible. And that's like the top up. Healthy progesterone, healthy adrenals, healthy metabolism all the way around. But look at this. So if we look at this symptom, estrogen, you know, as our hormones are declining, our brain needs to use a different source of fuel. So what are we going to use? Well, glucose is to gasoline as ketones are to jet fuel. You guys have experienced that, right? 
Glucose is to gasoline as ketones are to jet fuel. And I want to encourage you, you've been doing a ketogenic lifestyle. Test, don't guess, right? Test and see urine ketones, blood ketones. Check to see that you're making ketones, but check also that you're getting into an alkaline state because that makes a difference. Everyone is different. And I know um, Dr. Ali is also going to speak on autophagy. I want to share these slides. Monitoring, I'm monitoring for my next book. You guys will read about that on 20, you know, monitoring 24-hour glucose levels to see what's going on. So I thought I'd share with you, you know, I've been traveling a lot. So this one on the right where my blood sugar spiked up to 155 is pretty interesting. We got up early at 3 a.m. to go to the airport, and um, we're in the changing planes in Atlanta. And my daughter, Ava Marie, had five guys, and I had her go buy what she wanted, and she got five guys, and she got french fries. Mom, these are for you. I know how much you love them. Oh, honey, how can I refuse? Five five-guy french fries. So that was that peak up to 155, right? So that was interesting. And then lunch in East Texas, as she's in rodeo camp, we had jambalaya or something like that, supposedly with no grains in it, but it certainly did. I want to show you there's a spike in glucose, but what happened after? A sharp dip. What did I want to do? I wanted to take a nap, right? Our blood sugar swings affect our behavior, affect our energy level. But it's, you got to look at what it's doing to you. And then the next, uh, this was actually a couple days ago, June 25th. This is a fasting. I'm doing a prolonged fast until approximately 3 p.m. where the apple is. So just waking up in the morning in a, like a stressful morning, having to deal with a stressful situation, my blood sugar is going up, right? Cortisol is going up, blood sugar is going up. If I was in autophagy, I'm being kicked out of it even though I'm fasting. You guys have to realize how important the mind, the physiology, cortisol, stress, how important that can affect, a, affect you getting into ketosis with the lifestyle choices that you're making. And so, um, so it's helpful to look at that. You know, it's self-discovery. It's kind of fun. So how do we balance hormones? You know, as gynecologists, we, I really wanted it to be about estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, and even DHEA. I want it to be about that because I know that I spent $200,000 at least in education and youthful years learning about this, right? But it's really more than that. I mean, these are minor hormones, DHEA, melatonin, vitamin D, pregnenolone, very important, but still minor. The major ones are our stress hormones, adrenaline, that get up those drive hormones, cortisol, our stress hormone, and insulin. Insulin, very important. You know, with the ketogenic lifestyle, we work to create insulin sensitivity because besides our reproductive hormones that are declining as we get old, adiponectin is declining, and that's a hormone that in, as it higher it is, the more insulin sensitive we are. But that's declining also as we get old, right? Older. <laughs> and uh, what else? Cortisol and insulin are increasing as we age. Those, that's not fair, right? But the most powerful hormone is oxytocin. How many of you know what oxytocin is? A oh, good number, a good number. Oxytocin is absolutely my most favorite hormone. It is the hormone of love and connection and bonding. It, as an obstetrician, we know safety profiles of oxytocin are pretty, pretty good. We give pitocin in labor. That's oxytocin to increase your labor and um, to help you give birth. So we do that. It's not without its consequences. However, oxytocin is this hormone of love, bonding, and connection. And it's really powerful. We get it when we laugh, when we play, when we give, when we nourish, when we experience pleasure, and certainly when we have orgasm. So um, the nice thing is the higher we bring oxytocin, the more we're able to put cortisol in its place. We're able to put cortisol in its place. But when cortisol goes up, oxytocin goes down. Now, what happened to me? Post-traumatic stress leaves an underlying level of heightened cortisol and heightened adrenaline, heightened stress hormones. Your area of your brain called the paraventricular nucleus will say, okay, shut down cortisol. You're freaking frying me out, and this has got to stop, right? You're short-circuiting me. So all of a sudden, you go from this high cortisol state continuously to a very low cortisol state, and oxytocin is suppressed at the same time. So what that feels like, that's burnout. 
That's disconnect. That's when you walk into a restaurant and you see like people you grew up with and you're like, no one sees me. No one sees me. I'm not here. I don't know anyone. Or you're furthering isolation. Isolation, right? Depression, isolation. You, things you used to love, you no longer love. People you used to love, you no longer love. It ends up in divorce. It ends up in leaving your job. It ends up in not enjoying activities that you used to love and enjoy that got you out of bed in the morning. It's significant cause of depression. This is the cortisol oxytocin disconnect. And that's what we have to do with our lifestyle. The more oxytocin we have, the better alkaline pH we have. The more cortisol we have, the more acidic urine pH we have. So there's ways we can see, well, how am I doing? Because sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I don't know unless I'm testing. Like, is this improving my quality of life? Is this improving my physiology? So can you guys see that? That cortisol, you can maybe think of someone who had um, tra trauma, whether it was a war, whether it was a car accident, whether it was a terrible divorce, and all of a sudden, they're more isolated, they're more depressed. Maybe they go through a reactionary period that's oxytocin-seeking, maybe seeking sex, alcohol, shopping, gambling, thrill-seeking behaviors, maybe going through a period like that, and then really disconnecting, disconnecting. And so that's physiologic. And women who have had PTSD, women who are veterans of foreign wars, women who have had, and men, adverse childhood experiences, but women will go through menopause in a much more difficult way. Because again, this is a period of neurologic vulnerability. We have less progesterone. We have to get more progesterone on board. So we have to calm down our adrenals, we have to support our adrenals, and we have to increase more progesterone through lifestyle and maybe supplementation as we go along, herbs and, and um, bioidenticals. Cortisol is necessary. It's not all evil. If you don't have enough of it, you know, it's kind of like the, the you know, uh, lazy person on the couch, not doing much, right? The, you know, just kind of zoned out. That's too little cortisol. And then the there's a peak performance cortisol. We need peak performance. We need that passion in our hearts. Every one of you, I know that you have this passion. You're here for a reason, advocating for yourself or advocating for others. And so you have that passion. You need to maintain the physiology of passion. How's that? And if you have too much, it's panic, anxiety, it's disconnect, it's burnout. So we have to do that. So here's my, my switch on keto, the keto green way versus keto, right? We know we need to add healthy fats into our diet using healthy meat and fat sources, free range, grass fed, wild caught, home raised, organic, all those good things we need to do and add enough greens and fiber to help our body detoxify hormones. Because for estrogen detoxification, constipation is a killer, right? Constipation increases estrogen dominance, decreases the microbial diversity of our gut flora. But plant-based eating with the concepts of a ketogenic diet and ketogenic lifestyle are really powerful. So beyond healthy fats, what puts us into ketosis? Intermittent fasting, right? Intermittent fasting, that is essential. So looking at the blue zones around the world, majority, plant-based diets, huge, huge community and fellowship, right? Huge community and fellowship and a fasting lifestyle. Fasting lifestyle to get us into ketosis. We as women need this even more than our men. We are designed for this even more right? So getting into that ketosis through intermittent fasting, no snacking. Women hate it when I tell them no snacking. Like, what? I've been told three meals, three snacks, right? We've been told that, right? How ridiculous. So, I mean, that creates insulin resistance. That works against our hormonal physiology because, remember, cortisol, insulin, and oxytocin, the major hormones. If we are snacking all day, we're increasing insulin resistance. We're going to decrease progesterone. We're going to decrease DNA. HEA, we're going to affect our reproductive hormones, and we need these hormones for brain health. So ke eating keto green is really easy. These are zucchini noodles and scallops. Now, I always get the comments about the Inuits tribes, right, the Alaskans. Well, they just had fat, right? 
predominant fat, but they were eating fish bone broth. They were getting their minerals, their alkalinizer still. Bone broth is awesome addition to a keto grain lifestyle. Helping getting minerals. I see women shaking their heads. Yes, right? Bone broth is really powerful. Plus it gives our body chance to heal and rest and our intestinal lining ability to repair itself through not having to work on so much, you know, uh, digestion uh, process, digestive processes. So, we know that the, you know, there's, I've, again, I hear controversy about, well, the, you know, alkalinity, what are you talking about? The blood pH doesn't change. The blood pH doesn't change. I mean, a patient comes into my emergency room, I'm going to, and they're, they're coding or they're stressed or they're um, in an accident. I'm going to check an arterial blood gas. I'm going to stick a needle in their artery, radial artery, and pull out blood, flash it to the lab to get read that pH. That pH is relatively stable at approximately 7.4. A little bit higher, a little bit lower, it's not a good situation for my patient, right? But that's how we check blood gas, pH, right? But urinary pH, um, Changes. pH is different in areas or body. The vaginal pH is acidic. The stomach acid is acidic, right? We need to look at the, you know, different cellular uh, conditions and understand that. But we can say that uh, um, the research based in looking at uh, elevated urinary pHs can improve the quality of life. And I certainly have seen this in, in thousands of women who have done my program. When they add that alkalinity component into, so the greens and the lifestyle things like meditation, prayer, walking outside in nature, avoiding EMF lights, right? Um, I see they get this keto green, right? They get this we call it, it's like Christmas. You see ketones on the urine test strip and you see an alkaline urine pH. I call it energized enlightenment. The fog lifts. So many patients would tell me, I feel like the fog has lifted. And that's a good place to be, to have that mental clarity, that enlightenment. And a higher spiritual attunement is, is definitely what you can experience with adding, combining the ketogenic with incorporating your body into getting into ketosis on a regular basis, jump in, jump out, but on a regular basis and adding in the plant-based micronutrients and the lifestyles that help you maintain optimal health and physiology. It's not just one way. So an acidic urine will tell us many things, including in hormone imbalance and dehydration. And so many things affect our health. So stress, like I said, higher cortisol, cortisol increases um, decreases the urinary pH by increasing hydrogen ion secretion across the kidneys, across the renal tubules. So that's critical. Stress is a big thing. We need to manage our stress, even when we don't know how badly it's been affecting us. That's key. We can look at heart rate variability. As an obstetrician, heart rate variability is something I monitor when a baby's in utero. And somehow we forget about that once the baby's born. I mean, but it's crucially important, heart math, heart rate variability, increasing heart rate variability is key to coherence, is key to managing cortisol, is key to improving your quality of life. How cool is that, right? You can do, there's apps on your phone, you can just check through your phone's camera your own heart rate variability. Are you stressed? How are you handling the situation? You know, and it's, it's pretty cool. Um, other things, dehydration, if we're not getting enough water, and I you know, don't allow, I don't recommend drinking with your meals in between meals because when we dilute our digestive enzymes, we dilute the, di the acidity that, it's, you know, that it's supposed, our stomach's supposed to have to break down our meats, right, our food that we're eating. Take a piece of meat, pour acid on it, it dissolves, right? But take that same piece of meat, pour the acid on it, Pour a glass of wine, two glasses of wine, three glasses. Okay, that was last night, y'all. <laughs> you have diluted your digestive enzymes. You better have a prolonged fast, right? Don't dilute your digestive enzymes with your meal. Wait one to two hours after, okay? Inflammation. Inflammation from whatever cause. You, I want all of you to know your HSCRP number, highly sensitive C-reactive protein or cardio C-reactive protein. Know that number because so many people have worked, have hit walls, have not done well, and I check their HSCRP and they've got tremendous amounts of inflammation. But it's an early detector of inflammation. It's an easy, inexpensive test. 
food sensitivities, dairy sensitivities, um, citrus sensitivities. I mean, you could have a food sensitivity, and that's going to affect your ability to get alkaline, ability to lose weight, ability to break through the metabolic stall that you're experiencing. So we've got to check on food sensitivities, too. Not sleeping well. Sleep, sleep, sleep. So, you know, I, was, I, I love this. My friend Robin said this. She said, you know, sleep is like the new, some of the, the new, the sleep is like sex. Everyone's talking about it, but no one's getting enough of it. <laughs> so, sleep, critically important. But that can affect your body's pH. That can affect your ability to get into ketosis too. But regeneration, right? A good night's sleep will make you look younger. And medications can affect you. Blue light and EMF. Toxic emotions, fear, anger, hate, lack of forgiveness. In my online programs, we do a session on forgiveness. It's one of the biggest movers in healing that I've ever seen. Yeast overgrowth, candida, ketogenic lifestyle is very beneficial for this, but we need to sometimes bring on, we need to often bring on the additional alkalinizers, herbs, and principles and practices to really help defeat the yeast overgrowth. Skincare products, hugely toxic in many, so really get clean, organic, and the same with cleaning products. Sugars, wherever they come from, fruit, it can create inflammation in our body, can interfere with us getting into ketosis. So I want you all to be optimal, not normal. We look at normal labs. I constantly review labs. And someone will say, well, my doctor said these labs are normal. I'm like, they're normal, but they're not optimal. Let's get optimal. So Debbie, one of my clients online, her uh, first um, round of my Magic Menopause program, her inflammatory marker, HSCRP, was 32.7. I want it less than one. I want it optimal. So in a short amount of time, following the Keto Green lifestyle, right, following these principles, she was able to bring that down. It's not enough to think we're doing it right. Tests don't guess. You've got to discern what works for you. You've got to be your own Nancy Drew, right? You've got to figure out Hardy Boy. You've got to figure out what's working for you. You've got to be your detective. And Debbie, look, look at our hemoglobin A1C, 5.7, but her doctor read it as normal. It's every point above 5.3, our risk for Alzheimer's disease and dementia increases exponentially. So we want to fix that. And another beautiful woman, Tracy, 5.6, family history of diabetes on each side. Now her hemoglobin A1C is 5. So we want to see those improvements, but tests don't guess. So even if you just look at HSCRP, follow the hemoglobin as A1C, do that every couple months, you'll see as what I'm doing working for me to improve my metabolic status and brain health and hormonal balance for the rest of my life. These things make a difference. So take home message. It takes more than hormones to fix your hormones, right? It's not in a pill. It's not enough. Get keto green through the practices of getting your body into ketosis through intermittent fasting. And break fast with a keto green meal. So I always like clients to think fat and fiber, right, will really help with willpower and physiologic balance. And also to test, don't guess. Manage your cortisol and increase oxytocin. Increase the things that matter most in your life. You can connect with me at dranna.com and the, through my email, drannaquebeca.com. So again, I want to encourage you, what's better than an apple a day? You know that expression, apple a day keeps the doctor away? Well, the big O, so oxytocin, right? Oxytocin, the big O. So we've got that. And then uh, I'll give you my ebook. So I want to thank you guys for being here. A quick shout. We do a lot for our foundation. Everything that when I speak or when our products or contributions go to this foundation. So I want to thank you for contributing to that too. So thank you all. We have two minutes. We have, we have two minutes for questions, so we can get through one, maybe two questions, if anyone has them. Any questions? All right, brave, bold, beautiful, come up to this mic. Oh, come up here to this mic right in the center. Oh, yes. Thank you. Hi, Anna. Do you, can you hear me? Um, do you um, suggest a, a postmenopausal woman take DHEA? Yes, 
So it is a question if I heard it. Can a postmenopausal woman? Do you suggest that they all do, all oh. women that are postmenopausal? Well, so DHEAs peak in our 20s, and then they, right. DHEA peaks in our 20s and starts to decline. I think you should get a DHEA level. I think you should get a DHEA level test and see where you're at and watch that number because, you know, our adrenals produce DHEA, so do our ovaries. So postmenopausally, we don't have the ovarian support of the DHEA. So we need to see what that looks like. Right, but I have no ovaries. <laughs> if you're having symptoms, like certainly, you know, muscle loss, fatigue, decreased energy, our DHEA levels are low. We measure DHEA-S, DHEA sulfate in the blood, not straight DHEA, there's a difference. And look at that, but you know, like I'm a big advocate of vaginal and vulvar topical DHEA for women to help with vaginal dryness, libido, and for sexual health. Yeah, okay. So thank you, good question. One more last question. My question is, what happens when a females don't have the hormones anymore in their body? So, like, if you don't have the estrogen, you don't have what you're talking about, and you can't take replacements. Can you bring the microphone down a little bit more? There you go. Oh. When you can't take replacements due to the fact that they say that giving you those types of hormones would cause cancer, so if you've had a an issue with it before so they won't replace it so you have nothing in your body anymore so how do you control your hormones at that point so let me see if i understand your question so if you've had a history of cancer they're not allowing you to take any hormones Correct. So definitely something you want to, like the keto green lifestyle, combating insulin, like uh, Dr. Christie was saying earlier, becoming more insulin sensitive, that's key. Getting, you know, I would say get your alkaline pH good, get into ketosis, get into this fasting lifestyle, that's going to help you. And then talk with your, I have oncologists with, who have treating patients with breast cancer, et cetera, that are recommending, that are recommending my products like Jolva with DHEA in it, you know, or bioidentical progesterone. You have to talk, if you've had cancer, you've got to talk with your oncologist about them. Give them a copy of my book, you know, have, understand that. There's so much we can do through our therapeutic lifestyle changes and then see with the right oncologist or functional medicine provider what additional bioidentical support we can give because that's critical, especially post ovarian removal because we're, we're suffering without those ovarian hormones that we know, you know, our ovaries continue to produce hormones into our 60s and 70s. So um, it's, a, it's a tough pay, place to be in, but I want your oncologist to be on your side for this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm sorry, we're out of time for questions, but I will be at the, my booth, and thank you.